uh, Wednesday night, but there's a, there's a certain precedent for that in the sense that every Wednesday we say in the Shir Shel Yom, the song of the day, every day has a day that there's a chapter of Tehillim that's associated with each day, the Shir of the Levim, the song that the Levites sang each, each day. And the song that we sing on Wednesdays at the end of the Shir Shel Yom is the Chun Ranan Al Hashem. So there's an element of, of welcoming and greeting already on, on Wednesday. And to greet, it, to greet the Shabbos already on a Wednesday is, is still appropriate. So even though we're not even there ready for, for Shabbos, uh, but we're getting we're getting there. We're getting there. So it's so good to see everybody. I know it's good to see you, and I know it's hopefully. And I see. I know that it's great for everybody to see each other. So we're really appreciative of this time. So how you doing? Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Welcome and welcome to our community. Great to have everybody. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Jen, take it away. We have a, we have our first question of the night. Okay. Wait. Let's introduce. Okay. Hi, everybody. So um, the question we'll start off with is, um, has to be, these parshios are filled with lots of questions. We did a little bit last week also, but um, it's always, you know, whenever I think back to these parshios, it's very hard to understand how B'nai Yisrael made decisions that they made, and you wonder... You know, if we were in that time, we probably would have known better, right? But um, this week in the Parsha, they sent the Meraglim to Eretz Yisrael. They weren't sure that they were ready to go and conquer the land. They needed to send out spies to check it out first. And the report was not good. And, you know, I, I always like to wonder how how these problems and these fears and these the lack of amuna how we experience it today in the day, in the times that we're living in and the lashon hara then you know we 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 see things and we we have perspectives on them and we share our perspectives and how it can negatively impact other people and communities and um, families so how where do we see in life the story of Meraglin happening over again in 2020. And then, of course, how do we make sure that we don't let it happen and don't fall into the same trap as they did? Did you question? I did. I, did. I like that question. Somebody, one of you just text me uh, if you can ask questions. Of course you can. You can feel free to text me, and I'll ask your questions um, at the end. If we invite them, we can I, I think that's a very, very important question. It's a riveting question. I agree that I sometimes think, you know, you know, everybody's been saying hindsight is 2020. And it's a little bit ironic that the year that we want there to be in hindsight is, 20, is the year 2020. So hindsight is, 20, is 2020. And, and, you know, we always think that, you know, we could do it better uh, and we know better and we would be able to, you know, have the strength and the commitment and the resolve and the constitution and institution to be, resilient and different like it like people say if i saw god i would you know do this that or the other thing right. so is that really true if we no, you're good. They... yeah so i'll tell mm -hmm. you here, here's what's fascinating so i think that so a couple things but we could take this in, into a few different areas and and i certainly want to uh i want to be a listener to this young lady and to everybody here but i would just say the following let's start with this you know I, i've had a number of very riveting uh, emotions as I'm um, back in shul personally. Um, and, and there are a, there are scores, scores of different emotions that I've had um, from just A, seeing everybody, B, being back in, in our spiritual home uh, to see, you know, kind of seeing how things were left. There are certain things on my shender that were left from the last time I was there I and mean, the emotions of what that was like and certain um, things that, that came to, to, to feel because of that. But, but there's one thought that I think just, you know, as, as Jen was making, you know, presenting that question that really was, was main and percolated mostly, which is the following, which is imagine the scene, you know, when, when you're davening, you're facing east. So the members who are in the minion and they're facing east, so they're, they're just looking straight ahead. And you know, maybe they see the backs of some of the other people. And certainly as you're turning around, you see it. But from where I sit and I'm looking out, 
obviously when I'm davening Shmon I'm facing east. But when I look out and I see the the, the members who are who are gathered for for minyan for tefillah, so it's an unusual sight to see literally just the eyes of everybody. I, everybody's wearing masks, so like literally from the nose, the mouth, the mouths are are, are covered. And there's a lot of Torah and mysticism and Kabbalah to like the eyes. The eye is the window to the neshama, to the soul. And it's the, it's the essence of the person. And you really are able to like kind of tap into that. Mm-hmm. But it's a fascinating optic. It's an amazing visual to just literally see a, a, a people that are assembled in, in a house of prayer. And, and, and ostensibly, which is an activity of using our mouths. And all of us, our mouths are covered. Now, I know that not every shul and not every person and not every minion and not every, you know, but he's using masks. Although, you know, this is a, you know, PSA that everybody should <laughs> practice good social distancing. And, you know, statistics show that masks obviously mitigate risk, obviously, but that's not the commercial we're sharing right now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I'd like to call upon Matthew for a little demonstration. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and this Boca Jewish Center mask can be yours for five ninety five. Matthew. <laughs> Where'd you go, buddy? Anyway, thank you. So the, the point is, is imagine you're, you're like looking at like 20 people assembled and 25 people and everyone's wearing masks. And it's almost like the message is so strong. The message is, you're like, maybe my children, you have, to like, you have to like watch, you have to be careful with your mouths. Your mouths are now guarded. Your mouth, you know, shmira salashim means guard your tongue, guard your mouth, be careful with what you say. You know, it's, it's an incredible, incredible actual visual to see people assembled ostensibly using the mouth, the tool that Hashem gave us, the pair, the, the instrument that's unique to all of the other primates in the animal kingdom, that we use our mouth for communion with God. And that mouth is covered. And the lesson is like, is extraordinary. Um, that there's something about our mouths in the world. There's something about our mouths amongst each other. There's something about our mouths uh, with us and Hashem that needs to be like, you know, my, my mother used to say, my mom's not on here, so I guess like, my, my mother's always said that, that uh, she's got the eyes in the back of her, uh, you know, yeah. of her head, right? Everybody knows that. So, you know, you, you get your mouth washed out you're without with soap. And, you know, I'm not saying that ever happened, but it was certainly threatened to me a number of times. <laughs> uh, so the idea is that there's something about our mouths that need to be washed out. There's something about how it is. It's true. Thank you for your comment. It is so ingrained in our society that it's, it's so pervasive. It's in media. It's in rhetoric. It's, it's, you know, it's in every aspect of how we interact as a society and as a people. And it's so, it's terrible that, that, you know, we have to kind of think about what the root of that is. Why is it that there's so much that is focused on Shmir Salashan, on what we say and how we say it and to whom we're talking about and all of that. So let me just begin with, I think, just basics. You know, some of the primary Mufarshim commentaries teach that the, one of the, the, the impetus for speaking Lashon Hara uh, in a demoralizing, deprecating way about somebody else has a lot to do with the source of Lashon Hara. What's the source of Lashon Hara? The source of Lashon Hara is a person has insecurity. Insecurity in me that really stems from, I am not an Ezuhi Asher. As the Mishra says, a wealthy person is not a person who has anything else than a possession of their own lot, and they're happy with their, their lot. They don't have kina, taiva, kavod, they don't have desire, they don't have lust, they don't have honor that they're yearning yearn for, they don't have you know, a kid, jealousy, and they're just happy with what they have. When a person is, is in genuine happiness, peacefulness and tranquility with what it is that a person has, then I have no longer the burn, the desire, the interest, the need, the, 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 the pull, the gravitational, demonic pull to tell me to speak Ill about, about another person, about another thing. When I'm lacking that security, when I'm lacking that confidence in myself, in my family, my community, my relationship with the Rabboni Shum, so now, so then I have to then deal with that. And what do I do when I'm lacking something? I got to make myself feel better. So how do I make myself feel better? There's really kind of like two ways. You want to elevate yourself. You want to make yourself bigger. So Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb, actually, of blessed memory, is Nisham Shrav and Aliyah just passed away. Um, it's now the Shloshim, uh, a monumental leader in the Orthodox Jewish world. Um, so he wrote a book, Festivals of Faith. And in his book, one of his many books, he wrote an entry on Shabbos HaGadol, Pesach. And he talks about the elevating of man. And there are really two ways a person can elevate uh, oneself. A person feels low. You want to elevate yourself. You feel lowly. You want to bring yourself higher. So there's two ways you can feel high. The first is that a person which is the low level is you push somebody down. 
If I'm standing equal distance to somebody, I push somebody down. So by definition, I'm higher than that person. Sadly, that's how people get ahead. That's how people feel good about themselves. If I make you look bad, if I say ill things about you, if I talk negatively about you, somehow psychologically, the psychosis is that I feel better about myself because you're not good. And if you're not good, by definition, I'm good. Your opinion's not good. My opinion's good. That's one way. But he says there's a second way. And this is the place that we hope to achieve. And that is, you know how you elevate yourself over somebody? Is that you stand on a chair or you stand on a mountaintop. You just rise yourself. You stand up yourself. It has nothing to do with putting somebody down, but it has everything to do with picking yourself up. And I think what happens so much of what becomes people's extraordinary interest, desire, obsession is the ability to like, you know, sequester other people, place them in certain, you know, communities or, or orientations or fragmentations. And, and in so doing, what happens is that that insecurity is now is emboldened and is bolstered. And you feel good because I put somebody else somehow, if the restaurant that I described, if it's not good and I can tell how not good is my taste, my, my, my opinion is now, is now significant. And that's just one example of, of so many. Your politics and, and your theology and your choice of friends and the type of clothes you wear and where you go on vacation, L literally. I mean, you, you turn on any news station, read any, uh, any uh, magazine, and you do anything today. It's literally a million opinions upon a million opinions about everybody's thing. And in Khalila, God forbid, if a person would realize, you know, if a person would understand the the, the, the intensity, the penalty, the punishment, the need to wear a mask, the, the ability for a person to be careful with what they say, because if you understood how painful that is, not only to the person who is the, the speaker, but it's also terribly painful to the person who's the listener. The Chavetz Chaim says that when you speak, if a person does an Avera, for example, let's say I do, Khalil, a person does an Avera. So if you do an Avera, you get one sin. But let's just say you're speaking Lashon Hara to 10 people around the Shabbos table. You got 10 people, I shouldn't say Shabbos table. This is our, this is our, this is our virtual Shabbos table. Let's say you're at, around the restaurant. A restaurant, thank you. <laughs> so you're sitting there and you speak Lashon Hara, there are 10 people there. So says the Chavetz Chaim, you don't get one Avera, you get 10 Averas. You know why? Because every subject that heard your Lashon Hara, so that person, they are now the recipient of your Lashon Hara. In fact, and with this, I'll just, you know, open up to anybody else to share. The Gemara Maseches Ksuva says that there's every part of a person's body has a purpose. I've shared this before. The Gemara says that the lobe, the earlobe, has a, has a purpose, has a function as well. What's the purpose of the earlobe, says the Gemara Ksuvas? The Gemara says that you know how if you could take it and you could like shove it inside your ear canal if you could do it if you got it. Oh if, wow! And if it's and if it's not long enough, you can give a little yank. Yeah. And you shove it right inside there, and that's the purpose. So you should. I don't want to hear what you're saying. I don't want to hear it when anybody, you say something not nice about somebody. Count me out. So I think it's an amazing. Um, I think it's an amazing thing to think about that the optics of everyone's wearing masks and everyone's like meant to be careful. And some people are saying, I don't want to wear a mask. <laughs> well, the Rebosh is almost saying like, you have to wear a mask. There's a transmission of ill that will happen more if a person's not wearing, wearing a mask, certainly in the metaphysical sense. I, I want, um, Yao said, and I think she's so right. She um, chatted in that gossip is so ingrained in our society and it's so it's so true and it's so much harder to cure because of that. You know, you, you're just checking out in at Publix and like there's Lush and Hara like all across, you know, the checkout line, all the, all the magazines, like very normal to like just speak Lush and Hara about society, about people, about their private lives. And it's so, it has become so ingrained. And I think even like what you're saying, even to be the listener of Lush and Hara, it takes a lot of um, self self-awareness and and confidence to say i'm so sorry i don't want to listen that even is is a huge challenge for people because we're not even confident enough to do that we're not we don't we want to fit in with with the people that we're sitting with or we want to we don't want to be like the the firm religious one that's saying like no listen Hara, please it's even on from that perspective it's a very big challenge to really be confident you know, my, our, our, our girls, they, we have like very strict rules about them going out and if they want to go visit friends now. And I'm like, basically, basically we don't let them out. We don't let them out. Don't we let them out. out. But a lot of their friends that have, have been, have stopped um, the social distancing. And I, they tell me that when their friends start coming close to the car without masks, without anything, my girls start closing the windows on them. And I'm like, 
I'm blown away that they have the confidence and the strength to like say, I'm sorry, you back up or I'm this window is staying closed. You know, we the, actually caught one person's finger and we drove away <laughs> and they were just flying away. It's amazing. It and it takes a lot of strength of character to be able to, you know, fight against what is so prevalent in the world. And like Yal said, is so ingrained in our society. You have to be a really strong person to be able to say, you know, I'm so sorry. I really don't want to talk about that person. That's like embarrassing, you know? And unfortunately, we're embarrassed about the wrong thing. It's funny. I'm thinking about, you know, um, Ruth, do you remember a few years ago, you sent me, um, you gave me a periodical. I don't know if you still get it. It's called The Happy Times. Remember that? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Right? Right? Am I right? You said you gave it to me like years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I actually I have it on my desk still. Oh, now, now she just does organic um, no, but the, treatments and. But, right? it, but there's little. But there is a there's a there's a newspaper. It's called the Happy Times. You know how many people subscribe to the Happy Times? <laughs> one at least only one person. You know, Ruth Rappaport because she's a happy person. You, you know what? what? That's such a good point. That, people would, want the, the yeah. juice. They don't want I, the Happy. I've time. never been at a checkout at any at any uh, store. Which by the way, I don't go that often. But when I go. I'm pretty confident that they don't have the happy times that's like lining mm -hmm. the opposite the M&Ms and all the other Khazarai. I'm pretty confident they don't have the happy times. And that's a real sad, you know, that's a sad commentary. But I, I want to add just one other thing. That and, and the worse a person looks or acts, the, the better chance it's going to make the, the headline in the supermarket, right? Either they catch okay. a superstar without makeup on. Oh my gosh, we have to see it. Or we, they catch someone not behaving in a certain way. That's up there. What, Nancy? But let's not disparage M&Ms. Um, so I have a <laughs> Especially the one with peanuts. Was with peanuts. Um, I have a group of girlfriends that at one time, the, the group made a decision. We were all going to try for one hour a day to not speak Russian Hara. It's not so easy. Because from two to three, one person's not saying, and from three to four, another person's not saying. By the time you're done, you have a group. There's nothing to talk about. Nobody's talking to anyone. But that's not really true because we're all sharing recipes and we're doing different things. And we are speaking about things that actually matter. Right. But so it is challenging. Yeah, I, I love that idea. I have a friend that also tried to do like the two to three challenge. In the morning. You know, <laughs> two to three in the morning. <laughs> no, but he told me that he would try to take a nap <laughs> two to three. At least, right. But know. it can't be because Hashem didn't give us, uh, you know, a mitzvah that we aren't able to perform. Like it can't be that we can't talk for our hour. We have to be able to talk. We, we're given mouths for a reason. So. So, so I would say that I, I think it's true. And I think, you know, Yael just wrote something else, which I think is great. I really think when you think about a cure, like what, what's a cure? Like th there's nothing, A, the Rebunishal doesn't give us something that we can't do and accomplish and overcome and succeed and, and achieve. But it's also, there's no such thing as, as an illness that doesn't have a remedy. So there's an illness in the world called coronavirus. There's a remedy. Like we don't, it's available. It's not available. It might be available. It, there's, there's, a, there's a remedy. There's always a remedy, right? So what's the remedy? So I think that there's a great remedy. I think I'll just share some, which I think is just right spot on. And I'll just share with you what, I, which has, be, what has become like a rabbinic philosophy for me. And what she says is I don't want to take, you know, I'm not taking credit for this. This is what you said. And when you say something in somebody's name, you bring the redemption, which we need so badly, that the only cure comes when we become the one being gossiped about. Again, the cure comes when you, think, when, when you become the person that's being gossiped about, you then become a, a super sensitive and super aware of the intensity of it. Have you ever been on the, re uh, I think it's a danger. I think, so, I think something's a danger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. <clears throat> Have you ever? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, good. I think it's a bear. Anyway. Have you ever been the recipient of, of Lashon Hara, re recipient of somebody, you know, marring your, your, your stature, your, your words, your position, uh, your food, perspective. Uh, your perspective, your politics, and, and it all, either it's fair, either you feel like, who are you to comment about me? I, I'm still me. Or worse is that somebody's saying something about you that wasn't true. And then you got to like walk back something and you got to, you know, find, discover and recover where, how, when that all happens. So you could like edit, undo everything and anything that was seemingly said falsely in, in your name. I think that's true. So 
I, I try, and I, I'm not, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, just as um, anybody who on the call with me, but, here's, but, but here, here, here's what I would say is, is that, you know, when somebody speaks to me regularly about other people, which, you know, I'm sad to say that, that can happen, <laughs> that can happen. So what I find is I have a general rule is I'll say, thank you, masked man. I would say, thank you for that endorsement. So I would say, what I like to say to people is that I see anybody who speaks regularly to me about others, I'm pretty confident, that's right. I'm pretty confident that you speak to others about me. Like I don't see that that changes. It's not like you feel like you're in the click. You know, there's a click of people, you're sitting together, you're having coffee and everyone's like talking, oh, what did she do? And what did he do? And what did he say? And, hop, 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 hop. and look at this, look at that. So like, this, you feel good because you're part of the, you're, you're, in, you're in the in crowd that's speaking about other people. You're in the, you're the popular group. You're the people that are the authority. You're the ones who are, you know, the ones who can speak about others. And what happens is you have to realize that as quickly as you're speaking about others and they're speaking about others, you have to know the second you turn around, the second you're not in that group, everyone's speaking about you. I think that's, that is the remedy. How would we feel? How would you like it? How would anybody like it? If you heard somebody somehow say something about you, and, and, and you realize that, wow, that's not true. And I can't believe people say that. So I, I think it's very painful to, if you were <clears throat> the, the subject of the, of the gossip, but I ha have this feeling that even that wouldn't remedy it. Cause it, you see, like if, if something's not like blaring in your face, people really will go back to it no matter what. Like just even like we saw this shark and then we saw these teenage kids jumping into the water, which is totally not allowed in the intercoastal as far as I know, because there were like boats coming. Our and teenage, our kids? Not our teenage kids. And I, I yelled out to someone that we saw a shark, but like they didn't see it. So like they weren't scared, <laughs> you know, like I think if you don't see it with your own eyes, like I'm going to keep swimming because I'm having a fun time or like I don't see coronavirus in front of my eyes. So like I'm just going to be and then I let it go. Right. I, I don't know. I, I, I like that idea and it definitely would maybe help, but I don't know. I don't know. There was a some, week later, I, you forget about it. And I don't, about 10 days ago. I, yes, Linda. I read a good article this week by Rabbi Sachs. Did you read it on the Maraglim? That why I mean, two came away without the um, spying on them and seeing the wrong because they didn't listen. The rest of the group didn't listen. And we have to be careful that we listen and, and interpret it correctly. And that's why Joshua and Caleb came away because they saw it differently. And we have to be careful when we're with people that we have to see it. We have to listen carefully and make yeah, sure so, we interpret it correctly. Yeah, that was, that's a riveting piece, actually. Isaac sent it to me. I started reading right. it and I proved he sent it to me too. <laughs> there we go. Good. So yeah, that's that's the same article. So yes, yeah, so I want to address that actually because I think it's a very very important point. Uh, but before I do, I was just gonna you know add to the last thing that Jennifer said. But I, Linda, I want to get to that because I do think that that's a huge topic and I think that's a very important part of the whole Miraglim story. But it's like somebody was was uh, you know talking to me the other day, yeah, you know just about a topic that they were working through and uh, just other people talking about each other and other people, whatever it was. And he said, as like a throwaway statement, he says, Rabbi, you know that everybody talks about you every, every Shabbos, like when they get to the Shabbos table. <laughs> he was like, trying to make me feel bad. I was like, oh, so I, I was like driving somewhere. I was thinking to myself, I don't know if I have to pull over and throw up. I was like, I was like nauseous. I was like nauseous at the thought. And I think that it's true. When somebody's not before you, you don't know really, you don't trust it. On the other hand, like when, when you think that people are talking about you and you, you, you have to, A, you have to be a little bit more careful, but B, you know, I, I think we live in a time where somebody speaks ill of you, you like want, somebody punches you, you want to punch back a little bit harder. And, and it doesn't necessarily humble us the way we're supposed to have it, it humble us. And, and I know that when this person told me that, like I, we all know, you know, that I shouldn't say we all know, but you know, the, the rabbi gave a speech. So like, you know, people are dissecting when they get home and he said this and he should have said that, but he might've said that. And he was talking to her and she was talking to him and everyone was talking to everybody. But <laughs> the rabbi, was, and, and, how could he say such a thing? And I think he said that part before, maybe he said that story 16 years ago. He wasn't even here 16 years ago, but I think he said it. <laughs> Everybody's got up, but whatever it was, it like didn't apply to me. What, 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 yeah, there's something that's very sobering and very humbling about that. We say that everything we say, everything we see, everything we do is, is 
written, it's written in the book of life. It's written, the Almighty is watching and the Almighty is seeing. And everything we do has to be um, remembered to be that it's scrutinized and we be careful what's heard, what's seen. I think it's, uh, I, I don't disagree with Jan. I don't, I don't think that it's, you know, it's like out of sight, out of mind. But I think that there's, at least on a very low basic level, when you think somebody's talking about you, then certainly what it does, it, it definitely humbles you a bit. But I do want to address that for a second, Linda, because I think what you're saying, the idea of listening and, and who do you listen to and, and when do you listen to that person? And who, how do you interpret it? How do you interpret that? You know, if you were to ask me today, right now, um, and this can even jump into a little bit of controversial stuff. So like, dun, dun, dun. Uh, this is where things, we, nah, we'll just talk about what's in the happy times. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> From page to happy times. Mayor Rockford celebrates a milestone birthday. Happy birthday. That's the front page. That's all I care about. But, but you know, one of the greatest tragedies of this, of this whole process over these past number of months is the realization that there is no one source. There is no, you know, when, when the Beis Amikdash was, and please God will be, there's a Sanhedrin. There's a, there's, a, there's a Jewish Supreme Court, and that you, you like what they say, you don't like what they say, that's what they say, and that's the law. There's the enforcement of that law. There's, there's the, you know, the, the onslaught of rabbinic interpretation, rabbinic leadership. Some people, like, go, they go fishing, so they, you know, if they catch a fish that they don't like, they throw it back in, and they kind of go and look for another fish. Who do I follow? Catch and, and release. Catch and release. <laughs> That's his catch and release. You can go catch her. <laughs> She's on her A game always. Um, so th there's catch and release. And even just in the world of medical, you know, advice and who's the expertise and what's the CDC and what's the WHO. All of a sudden I'm playing all these like Rashi Tavis, all these acronyms now, which I don't even know what they are. There's a CDC, there's an RDC, there's an ABCD, there's a BCBC, right? T-A-B-Y, T-A-B-Y? Was that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Too. So every, everything that's everything that's out there, and, and I would say that, that that's that's brought a colossal. And I don't use that word lightly. A colossal, colossal amount of confusion to people when it comes to when do you close and when do you open and how do you reopen and who do you listen to and masks and social distancing and Corona's over and Corona's not over and I should do this and I should do that and everybody's value. It seems to be like it's the it's like Rabbi J.J. Schachter spoke in our, our shul the first time. He spoke a number of times. The first time, years, years, years ago, in the old space, um, my first old space, um, when he said that Judaism is not supposed to be Judy who makes her own ism. Judy's ism. Judy ism. Right? Everybody makes their own version of it. So who do you listen to? And what do you do? I, I don't think it should be this. And I don't think it should be that. And there's an extraordinary amount of confusion. There's an enormous amount of peer pressure. There's an enormous amount of uncertainty. And that's left a lot of people just unaware of what, what does transition back to life look like? It's hard for leaders. It's hard for rabbinic leaders. It's hard for civic leaders. It's hard for Askanim. It's hard for everybody. You open parks, you don't open parks. The president says this, the president doesn't say this. The rabbi said this, the rabbi said that. This, you know, we should use masks, we shouldn't use masks. We're talking about major, major confusion, even in the world of who it is that we listen to. And that's been a huge problem in our, in our Jewish community. That's been a big problem in the world that, that I think really is going to demand another level of, of introspection at some point part of what we're yearning for for there to be change is there's going to be some level that maybe somebody's going to say something that's not going to be exactly the way we want it to be but we're going to have to accept it because it's just the authority of what what shulchan aruch is what the torah demands of us there's something called das torah das torah means that maybe you know the rabbi whoever the rabbi is you know is going to be asked the shaila and the shaila is going to be answered now it's true das torah doesn't always mean that there's one size fits all there's answers that are given. You know, somebody's a Baal Tshuva, someone's a Baal Tshuva, someone's on this level, someone has that challenge, someone has that. There's, there's a variety of different components of what Das Torah is, but everything is now confused. Everything is confused. And it's going to really, gonna, it's going to really boil down to in this stage, which I think is going to be our, our, the ultimate stage of whether or not we're going to re-enter peacefully and, and, and with brotherhood and with community and unity, if we're, if we're going to be able to rally behind, uh, you know, units that are going to bring us together that are not going to separate us. I think I we guess. entered into the coronavirus era very singular and very unified. And I just can only hope and pray that that stays and maintains itself. There have been so many wonderful stories. 
Um, and we should only hear those stories, we should only promulgate those stories, but I think we should strengthen ourselves, you know, uh, so much in, in this regard. Other question here? Yeah. What? Oh, I, question. oh, I thought Nancy maybe had a question. No. Oh, I, I, I would add that, um, that I, I looked at your, what Linda said also differently is perspectives and how you see things. Um, so my kids, like now that school's over, the, the thing that I'm hearing, you know, over and over again right now is Ima, I'm bored. It's like, I, it's not allowed even anymore in my house. Like you're not allowed to use that word. Uh, Matthew, you can relate. Um, so we were, again, on the, everything goes back to the intercoastal. So you see these like huge, beautiful mansions and there's like boats docked there and jet skis and canoes. And it's like, oh, if we just had a jet ski, like we would just go jet skiing all day long. Or if we had canoes, like we do that all day long. And, mm -hmm. and I said to my kids, I'm like, you see that house? I'm like, those kids are bored. I promise <laughs> you those kids are bored because we have a pool. My sister is driving from New Jersey down to Orlando next week because they just want a pool. That's all they want. But after a week or two weeks or three months, like you don't want a pool anymore. So your perspective, I think that it's like the whole Samer Bechelko, like we have to learn how to see things and interpret things and have a perspective that is a healthy one because things are always changing and things are always get, getting stale and you don't have the proper <laughs> If you don't have the proper perspective, you could be miserable always. So, so I think that when I when I think of the Miraglim, like the article going in, like how are we supposed to interpret things? How are we supposed to see the good in things? Yeah. That's what I was understanding. Right, right. From that. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I would just. I, would just, I just got another question. And I think also, it's a really important uh, point. How about good speech? Does this also hurt the same as evil speech? So actually a lot of the commentaries point out that, that the way a mitzora, the way one who's afflicted with saras, with the affliction that's given to a person for speaking Lashon Hara, they have to bring not one bird as, a, as, a, as an atonement, as a, as a carbon, as a kapara, but they have to bring two. And the commentaries wonder like, why should it be that there should be an obligation for two? There should only be an obligation for one. If I speak ill about one person, I have to speak, I have to bring a carbon to, to rectify, to remedy what's, what I did. So the commentaries say that the, there's one bird is for the evil speech, but the other bird that you have to bring is for the good speech that you didn't speak. You have to, do, you have to repent and uh, you, know, you need atonement for the good that you didn't say. It's not just that like it's the absence of, it's not like you, you speak ill of somebody and therefore you, you know, like, okay, you're just in violation of speaking ill, but you've actually missed an opportunity to speak good. As there is damage for what one speaks when they speak ill, how much good, how much positive, how much milestone, how much incentive it can be spread when you speak good about somebody. Now, sadly, the good doesn't spread what so it seems as quickly and as fast as the bad. That is terrifying. But we, sh you know, the damage, the hurt of speaking good is only that if we don't speak good and we don't speak two things simultaneously, we're only able to speak one thing. So when we use our mouth to speak one thing simultaneously, it's one thing singular. So the bad thing we've spoken has covered, has concealed, has trumped, has dominated, has eclipsed the possibility of speaking good. And that is something that we have to atone for. I have missed my opportunity to say something positive. Torah, Torah Academy had the most beautiful presentation last night. Lindsay, did you yep. watch it? Yep, sure it was, did. It was so it was a, it was their annual dinner at dinner, and it was a tribute to the teachers and staff. And Rabbi Crone told a few stories about how teachers impacted him, and he and he said how he has he had a teacher who in you know I think in high. In eighth, middle school, eighth grade. Eighth grade, yeah. He said something that impacted him that he doesn't forget to this day, and it was a negative thing. It was about like this kid will never write a book, and meanwhile, Rick Crone wrote several books, but it never ever left his head. And he had one rabbi who he still has to this day who 
who told him that he asked an amazing question and he can't, he never will forget it. And he, it built him up and made him feel so good because he was amongst a, a room of Rebaim and he was like 21 years old at the time. And it's so true how both negative speech and positive speech has such an impact on a person. And, and it stays with you forever. You remember the most random things about some, if someone says something that shook your core or spoke good of your core, you just never forget it. And we have that power. And, and I loved it. I thought it was such a, you know, teachers have this amazing responsibility and, and ability to impact us, hopefully positively. Nancy Eisenberg, I think, had a question. No, I just wanted to say that when I learned Hilfus Lashonhara, I also learned that you shouldn't take anything good because that could also be destructive. Like when, you know, if you say, but they're, but he's great. Well, that's so great because you, know, you could like turn something good into something bad. Do you freeze? Yeah. Wait, do we lose them? We we didn't. We were frozen. Were you guys all frozen? We missed no. it. Yeah. Just, yeah. Now, what I was saying was, when I learned Yelkos Lashon Hara, I also learned that you shouldn't speak anything because even Lashon Tov can be turned around to be Lashon Hara. So. I heard that too. Nancy, I heard the same thing too. I was taught that by Rabbi Freeman, yes. And so you know where we see an example of that? In Yo. Remember how his friends, the reason why the angels went to Hashem was because they were saying all these nice things about him or whatever, 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 whatever. And then Hashem, and then he had no choice but to bring back to him. Right, he brought back to him. When he brought back to him, then they to, 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 you have to prove to the Yet Sahara that, oh no, that yo don't just, he doesn't just like me because I am good to him. Hey, I can give him bad and he still would like me. And that's why, because, and that's what Rabbi said, because they were speaking such nice things about him, they caused yo to suffer. I heard that. I'm going to stop that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, to, to, I would just add to that, which is, the, the Mishnah says in Perkei Avos, in Ethics of Our Fathers, Siag L'Chachma is Shtika. The, the, the foundation, the, the, the perimeter, the fence uh, to wisdom is when a person is silent. It's true. That, that the Chavetz Chaim writes that it's sometimes better for a person to be quiet than to say anything. We, we're not as careful. We live in a time where we're careful with what we eat. We try to be careful with our bodies and exercise. We try to be... We have to exercise the same cautiousness with how we talk. We have to be scrupulous with what we say and when we say it, with whom we say it. But the siag lechachma. Froze again. Yeah, you're froze. Rabbi, right. did you get a new service? And that is, and, though, and, and 27, <laughs> and that's the lottery number ticket, uh, the numbers for the lottery tonight. <laughs> All right, you got that or no? <laughs> I think no, that's why you leave Comcast and go to somebody else or what? We, 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 we oh my we gosh, it's been such a production. Next week, we're going to be Next literally week. in your living rooms. You don't know what's going to happen. We are going to be <laughs> in your living rooms. You're going right. to we went back to right. our old service. Oh my right. God. Still not connected, but I'll hopefully cross your fingers tonight or tomorrow if I could figure out how to do it. <laughs> What, talking about Lashon Hara, evil tongues, or bad words and stuff, I sometimes get very upset and disturbed within our own communities when people speak disparagingly about different minorities, different groups of people and so on. And uh, I think we as Jews particularly should uh, be very careful about that. Sometimes, you know, you put yourself in an awkward situation, people say things that or the group and so on. And I'm not often, fortunately, but periodically I've had to tell people, you know, I, I don't share your views and I'm not want to hear them, you know. But, 
Yeah. Wow. So I totally, I, I agree with you. I, but it, it's, it's a difficult thing to deal with, particularly within our own community. I, I totally agree with you because we're, we're a Mamlechus Kohanim Vagai Kadosh. And when you're a Mamlechus Kohanim Vagai Kadosh, you're expected to live by a higher standard and morality of a higher, of a higher calling. And sadly, even within our own ranks, that's something we need a lot, a lot of chizuk, a lot, a lot of, of strengthening. To speak ill of anybody is awful. To speak ill of minorities is, is doubly awful. And it, it should be not tolerated. It should be called out. But I think that here's what I would say is the charge for all of us, which is we're a people of the book. We're a people of, of, of chinuch, of education. We're a people that follow the Torah, that we bring light unto the nations. I would only add to that, we bring light unto even our own nation. So, you know, your, your, your personal even keel disposition have the ability to educate people and to inspire people with your personality. And we can never stop the fight. Like, I think we have to raise our, our voices and our arms in protest not, God forbid, in violence, but the protest, injustices, social or otherwise around the world. And we are very equipped to do that. We have the Torah, we have morality, we have ethics, we have, we have the ability to, with, with authenticity, really teach people, teach the world that there should be no place for any bit of, of mi you know, minimalist ridicule of anybody, 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 um, you know, that's, uh, that's a, that's Great. a, Nancy, Nancy, Nancy Rabbi, you? may I say thank you for saying that. Um, my rabbi in California gave a huge speech on that. And, um, I didn't hear he was the only person I knew that actually came out and talked about that. And he used it in reference to Miriam and Aaron when they spoke about Moshe's wife and that she's a cushy. And, um, Basically, and he said, which was so beautiful, Hashem immediately, I mean, I was, so, when he said, I, I said, whoa, there goes my boy Hashem. I was immediately, immediately, he shut it down. He shut it down immediately. And she said, I was like, whoa, you know, Rabbi, I, I high five, right? I had to high five Hashem. He immediately, immediately shut it down. Meaning, you do not. Do not call her a cushy. You don't do not talk about my, my friend, my best friend, Moshe. Hey, to be, to stand up in the face of adversity and to be the only person that is gorgeous. I mean, I said, whoa, there goes Hashem. Can I, I, can I make, yeah, that, that's great. I love it. I love it. I love your passion. Um, I would just say somebody told me this week, which I thought was also great. Everybody's talking about, you know, if you're older than a certain age or you're compromised, you have a tertiary condition, right? You're immunocompromised, you're compromised, right? Everyone's talking about the population. Right. So somebody said to me, everybody's compromised. Some people know about it and some people don't know about it. Everybody's compromised. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. Everybody's, yeah. there's a minority in everybody. There's, there's, a, there's a part yeah. of everybody in everybody. And Achil Hashem Otsam, if anybody fails, to remember that we're all compromised. Somebody's, in, and maybe you know that you're compromised, but if somebody doesn't know they're compromised, come on, we're all compromised. Anyway, yeah. we are together and we are ba'achdus and we should be, uh, you know, high fiving yeah. each other and diving to Hashem. High five, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, you yeah. got it. You said it. <laughs> Yeah, yep. I, I got to run to Mincha, but Nancy, I can't leave without giving you your chance to say, yeah, you got your hand up. You're so polite. You did it like that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that, but you So I just wanted to say that the coronavirus was the great equalizer. Whether you were rich or poor, whether you were a minority or the majority, it was the great equalizer. It took everybody from the top to the bottom. And I think that it is beyond arrogance for, for anybody to look at anyone else as less than in this environment particularly and i think and i think that that's probably why listen there's been police violence straight through history really we know this so i think that it was this virus that really made everybody look and say wow this is this is particularly wrong and it it, it really just brought it to the fore it made if everybody i'll speak for myself I have a tendency to speak for everybody. <laughs> I'll speak for myself. For me, I realized that 
I'm no better and really no worse than anybody else. And that everybody, if we can all take each other's hand and instead of looking to leap over people because we need money, we need this, we need that, and we do, we, we need all those things. But if we can hold each other's hands, we can, you know, I'm going to tell a very quick story because it's the best story my dad ever told me in my whole life. He sent, a man was on his deathbed and he sent, his, I'm sure you've heard this story, his three sons into the field. He said, I want you to come back with three good hearty sticks. Each of you come back with a stick. And he, when the boys came back, two sticks, everybody gets two sticks. And he said to the boys, I want each of you to break your stick. They broke the good stone. Boys, they broke the stick. He said, now I want you to put all three sticks together, see what you can do. The three sticks they couldn't break. He said, if you three, three boys will stick together for your whole lives, you can accomplish anything. And that's what I say to this country. And that's what I say to this Kahila. I say it to the, to the Jewish people because we're so diverse, such a diverse group, you know, from mm -hmm. the Hasidish to the, to the reform and so on and so on. If we'll stick together, we can do anything. I think you just spoke to the American people, and I want to know if you will choose me as your vice president. I'm voting for you. Choose yes, me. Yes. Well, I'm voting for the young lady, but she I'll did. Be the vice president. I'm going to run to Mincha. I believe our shop is able to the person who's in charge of our shop is We love. Can we you have so a uh, Can we have a cameo? Yes. 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 I'm out. I'll see you later. Good shop. So nice Let's see, see if he's up. Hold on. Okay. I'll leave you guys alone in my office, please. If you take any safer, just please put it back. <laughs> she did.